Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and M&A decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace we have partnered with has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now i want to highly recommend you get acquisition aficionado magazine every month acquisition aficionado magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello, and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today, I'm here with Ollie Penman, who's not a real person. That's right, I'm interviewing artificial intelligence bot ChatGPT. As always, we like to start an interview with a bit about our guest. Who are you, and how did you learn what you know? I am an artificial intelligence created or trained by OpenAI and animated by Synthesia. I was designed to assist with a variety of tasks, including answering questions, providing information, and generating written content. I was trained using a process called machine learning, in which I was fed large amounts of text data and learned to predict the next word or sequence of words in a given text. This allowed me to learn about a wide range of topics and develop the ability to understand and respond to natural language inputs. I am not a person, but rather a collection of algorithms and software programs designed to simulate human-like conversation and information processing. I do not have personal experiences or feelings, but rather rely on the knowledge and information that I have been programmed to access. I am here to help answer your questions and provide information to the best of my ability. Please let me know if you have any further questions or need assistance with anything. This show is about buying, growing buyer acquisition, and selling SMBs. What is an SMB? SMB stands for small and medium-sized business. This term is often used to refer to businesses that are smaller in size than large corporations, but larger than micro-businesses or sole proprietorships. SMBs are typically characterized by their relatively small number of employees, revenue, and market share compared to large corporations. There are many different types of SMBs, ranging from retail stores and restaurants to manufacturing firms and service providers. These businesses are an important contributor to the economy, as they often drive innovation and provide employment in local communities. SMBs may face different challenges and opportunities than larger businesses, and may require specialized support and resources to succeed. Many organizations and programs exist to support SMBs, including business associations, government agencies, and financial institutions. When we say SMB, we are talking about businesses just under the radar of private equity. In most at Dusty's, this is usually below 20 million in revenue. That said, why would I buy an existing business rather than start one? There are several reasons why an entrepreneur might choose to buy an existing business rather than start one from scratch. 1. Established customer base. An existing business may already have a customer base and reputation, which can provide a foundation for future growth. 
2. Proven Business Model An existing business has already gone through the process of developing and testing a business model, which can save time and resources. 3. Existing Infrastructure An existing business may have established systems, processes, and relationships that can be leveraged to drive growth and efficiency. 4. Immediate Revenue and Profits An existing business may already be generating revenue and profits, which can provide a source of income and a return on investment. 5. Experienced Employees An existing business may have a team of experienced employees who can provide valuable expertise and help transition the business to new ownership. Of course, there are also challenges to buying an existing business, such as the need to integrate the business into your own operations and the potential for hidden issues or liabilities. It is important to carefully research and evaluate the business before making a purchase to ensure that it is a good fit and has the potential for success. What would be a good project outline for acquiring a SMB? Here is a potential project outline for acquiring a small or medium-sized business. Step 1. Selection Criteria Identify the key criteria for selecting a target business, such as industry, location, size, financial performance, and growth potential. Step 2. Sourcing Ideas Develop a list of potential target businesses using a variety of sourcing methods such as online marketplaces, industry networks, and advisors. Step 3. Getting the first call with the business owner. Research the target business and its owner to identify common ground and potential points of interest. Reach out to the business owner to introduce yourself and request a call or meeting. Step 4. Rapport Building During the first call or meeting, focus on building rapport and trust with the business owner by listening actively, asking open-ended questions, and showing genuine interest in their business. Step 5. Negotiation after building rapport, begin to explore the potential for a deal and negotiate the terms of the acquisition. Use negotiation strategies such as active listening, open-ended questioning, and the flinch to create a win-win outcome. Step 6. Due diligence. Once the terms of the acquisition are agreed upon, conduct due diligence to verify the financial and operational information provided by the seller and to identify any potential risks or issues. Engage experts such as accountants, lawyers, and industry advisors. Step 7. Closing. After completing due diligence and resolving any issues or concerns that arise, finalize the acquisition agreement and prepare for the closing. Coordinate the transfer of assets, liabilities, and ownership, and ensure that all necessary documents and payments are completed. Step 8. Integration. After closing, begin the process of integrating the acquired business into your own operations. This may involve integrating systems, processes, and cultures, as well as transferring employees, customers, and suppliers. Step 9. Evaluation. After the acquisition is complete, evaluate the results and assess whether the acquisition met your expectations and objectives. Use this information to inform future acquisition strategies and processes. Selection criteria. Can you explain further how an entrepreneur would know which business they should buy? There are several factors that an entrepreneur should consider when deciding which business to buy. Some key considerations include 1. Industry and market conditions. It is important to choose a business that operates in an industry with favorable market conditions, such as strong demand, growth potential, and a favorable competitive landscape. 2. Financial performance. Look for a business with a track record of stable and growing revenues and profits, as well as a healthy balance sheet. 3. Growth potential. Consider the potential for growth and expansion in the business, such as through new products or markets. 4. Management team. Evaluate the skills and experience of the business's management team, as well as their vision for the future of the business. 5. Fit with your own skills and experience. Choose a business that aligns with your own skills, experience, and interests, as this can increase your chances of success. 6. Location. Consider the location of the business and whether it is accessible and convenient for you and your customers. Ultimately, the best business to buy will depend on your specific goals and circumstances. It is important to carefully research and evaluate your options to find a business that meets your needs and has the potential for success. You say, fit with your own skills and experience. Have you heard of the Japanese concept of Ikigai and can you explain it? Yes, Ikigai is a Japanese concept that refers to one's sense of purpose or meaning in life. The word Ikigai is made up of two Japanese characters, Iki, which means life, and Gai, which means value. Together, these characters translate to the value of one's life, or one's sense of purpose or meaning. Ikigai is often described as the intersection of four key elements, what you love, 
what you are good at, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for. The idea is that by finding alignment among these four elements, one can discover their ikigai and achieve a sense of fulfillment and happiness in life. Ikigai is often associated with the idea of flow or the state of being fully immersed and engaged in an activity. It is believed that finding and pursuing one's ikigai can lead to a sense of flow and happiness, as well as improved physical and mental health. What are the different ways to source deals when looking to buy an SMB? There are several ways to source deals when looking to buy a small or medium-sized business. 1. Online Marketplaces There are many online platforms that list businesses for sale, such as Biz Buy Sell, Businesses for Sale, and LinkedIn. These platforms can be a good starting point for finding potential deals. 2. Industry networks. Building relationships within your industry or niche can help you identify potential acquisition opportunities. This can include joining industry associations or attending events and conferences. 3. Advisors. Working with advisors such as business brokers, investment bankers, or M and a lawyers can help you access a broader range of deals and provide guidance on the acquisition process. 4. Networking. Building relationships with business owners, entrepreneurs, and other professionals in your industry or community can help you uncover potential acquisition opportunities. 5. Direct outreach. Reaching out directly to businesses that you are interested in acquiring can be an effective way to explore potential deals. This may involve identifying businesses that fit your criteria and reaching out to the owners to express your interest. By using a combination of these approaches, you can increase your chances of finding a suitable acquisition opportunity. It is important to be proactive and persistent in your search, as it can take time to find the right business. You mentioned different sources for deals. Could you draft a cold outreach message I could use via email or LinkedIn to inquire if a business owner is interested in selling their business? Sure, here is a sample cold outreach message that you can use to inquire about a potential acquisition. Subject, Potential Acquisition Opportunity Dear, I hope this email finds you well. My name is Ronald Skelton and I am an entrepreneur interested in exploring potential acquisition opportunities. I came across your business and was impressed by its track record and growth potential. I would like to inquire whether you are open to discussing the possibility of selling your business. I believe that my experience and resources could help take the business to the next level, and I am committed to preserving its legacy and culture. I understand that this may be a sensitive topic, and I want to assure you that I am approaching this with the utmost professionalism and respect. I would welcome the opportunity to discuss this further with you and learn more about your vision for the business. Thank you for considering my request. I look forward to your response. Sincerely, I hope this message is helpful. Please keep in mind that this is just a sample and may need to be customized to fit your specific situation and goals. It is important to be respectful and professional in any cold outreach and to clearly communicate your intentions and value proposition. Once I have the business owner on the phone, what are some questions I could ask to build rapport? Building rapport is an important step in the acquisition process as it helps to establish trust and establish a foundation for a potential partnership. Here are some questions you might consider asking to build rapport with a business owner. 1. How did you get started in this business? 2. What do you enjoy most about running this business? 3. What are some of the biggest challenges you have faced in running this business? 4. What are your long-term goals for the business? 5. What do you see as the biggest opportunities for growth and expansion in the business? 6. What has been your proudest achievement as a business owner? Asking open-ended questions that allow the business owner to share their story and perspective can help to build a connection and establish common ground. It is also important to listen actively and show genuine interest in what the business owner has to say. This can help to establish trust and create a positive foundation for further discussions. I guess the next step is negotiation. What are some tips and resources I could use to learn to be a good negotiator? Effective negotiation is an important skill for any entrepreneur and can be especially valuable in the process of acquiring a business. Here are some tips and resources that you might find helpful in learning to be a good negotiator. 1. Know your goals. Clearly define what you want to achieve through the negotiation and focus on your key priorities. 2. Understand the other side. Try to see the situation from the other party's perspective and consider their needs and motivations. 3. Prepare thoroughly. Research the business and industry and gather data and information that can support your negotiation position. 4. Communicate effectively, use clear and concise language, and try to establish a respectful and professional dialogue. 5. Be open to compromise, be willing to give and take, 
and look for mutually beneficial solutions. There are also many resources available that can help you develop your negotiation skills, such as books, courses, and workshops. Some popular books on negotiation include Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Ory and Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. You may also find it helpful to seek the guidance of an experienced mentor or advisor who can provide guidance and feedback on your negotiation skills. You mentioned Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference. I've interviewed one of his coaches and love his work. Can you summarize that book and his steps of negation in detail? Never Split the Difference. Negotiating as if your life depended on it is a book written by Chris Voss, a former FBI hostage negotiator. In the book, Voss outlines his approach to negotiation which is based on the principles of empathy, rapport building, and effective communication. Here are some key concepts and strategies from the book. 1. Empathize. Empathizing with the other party involves understanding their perspective and trying to see the situation from their point of view. This can help you to identify their needs and concerns and to develop mutually beneficial solutions. 2. Build rapport. Building rapport involves establishing a connection and sense of trust with the other party. Voss recommends using mirroring, labeling, and calibrated questioning to build rapport and establish a collaborative relationship. 3. Use effective communication. Voss emphasizes the importance of using clear and concise language, avoiding jargon, and being aware of nonverbal cues in communication. He also recommends using the black swan technique, which involves asking open-ended questions that prompt the other party to reveal their underlying concerns and motivations. 4. Negotiate based on interests, not positions. Voss advises focusing on the underlying interests and needs of the other party rather than their stated positions or demands. By identifying these interests and finding ways to meet them, you can create win-win solutions that address the needs of both parties. 5. Use the flinch. The flinch is a technique that involves making an initial offer that is slightly lower than your target, in order to prompt the other party to counter with a higher offer. This can help to create a sense of momentum and momentum and encourage the other party to compromise. 6. By using these strategies and techniques, you can improve your negotiation skills and achieve better outcomes in a variety of situations. What is mirroring, labeling, and calibrated question? Mirroring, labeling, and calibrated questioning are techniques that can be used to build rapport and establish a collaborative relationship with the other party in a negotiation. Here is a brief overview of each technique. Mirroring. Mirroring involves repeating or mimicking the other party's words or body language in order to establish a sense of connection and similarity. For example, if the other party speaks slowly and calmly, you might adopt a similar pace and tone in your own communication. Labeling. Labeling involves acknowledging and naming the emotions or concerns that the other party is expressing. For example, you might say, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated because you feel like we're not listening to your concerns. By labeling the other party's emotions, you can show that you are attuned to their feelings and create a sense of understanding. Calibrated questioning. Calibrated questioning involves using open-ended questions to encourage the other party to reveal more information about their needs and motivations. These questions should be tailored to the specific situation and designed to elicit specific responses. For example, you might ask, what would need to happen for you to feel like this deal is fair? This type of question can help you to gather more information and identify areas of common ground. By using these techniques, you can build rapport with the other party and establish a collaborative relationship that can facilitate more effective negotiation. Ties also says don't feel their pain, label it. Can you explain what Chris means by labeling? In Never Split the Difference, Chris Voss advises negotiators to label the emotions and concerns of the other party, rather than trying to feel their pain. Labeling involves acknowledging and naming the emotions or concerns that the other party is expressing without necessarily trying to fully understand or empathize with their perspective. For example, if the other party is expressing frustration, you might say, it sounds like you're feeling frustrated because you feel like we're not listening to your concerns. By labeling the other party's emotions, you can show that you are attuned to their feelings and create a sense of understanding. This can help to build rapport and establish a collaborative relationship. Voss recommends using labeling as a way to acknowledge the other party's emotions without getting caught up in them. 
By remaining calm and objective, you can maintain your focus on finding mutually beneficial solutions and avoid getting sidetracked by emotional reactions. Kais talks about cognitive bias and loss aversion in his book. Can you explain those as they pertain to negotiating the acquisition of a business? Cognitive bias and loss aversion are psychological phenomena that can influence the way that people perceive and respond to situations, including negotiations. Here is a brief overview of how these concepts can impact the acquisition of a business. Cognitive bias. Cognitive bias refers to the systematic patterns of deviation from norm or rationality in judgment, whereby inferences about other people and situations may be drawn in an illogical fashion. In the context of negotiation, cognitive bias can cause people to rely on their preconceptions or stereotypes, rather than considering all the available evidence. This can lead to poor decision-making and prevent the parties from finding mutually beneficial solutions. Loss aversion. Loss aversion refers to the tendency for people to strongly prefer avoiding losses to acquiring gains. In the context of negotiation, this can cause people to be more resistant to change and more likely to hold on to their existing positions, even if it means foregoing potential gains. This can make it more difficult to reach a mutually beneficial agreement. By understanding and addressing these psychological factors, you can improve your negotiation skills and increase the chances of a successful acquisition. For example, you might try to counteract cognitive bias by seeking out objective data and evidence to support your arguments, and by being mindful of your own biases. To address loss aversion, you might try to reframe the conversation in terms of potential gains or benefits, rather than focusing on potential losses. Before we move on, one last question about negotiations and Chris Voss's methods. He talks about accusation audits. Can you explain? An accusation audit is a technique that Chris Voss recommends using in negotiations to identify and address any underlying issues or concerns that may be causing conflict or disagreement. To conduct an accusation audit, you would start by making a list of any accusations or negative statements that the other party has made during the negotiation. These might include statements like you're not being fair, you're not listening to me, or you're trying to take advantage of me. Next, you would review the list and try to identify any common themes or underlying issues that these accusations might be pointing to. For example, the other party might be expressing a concern about fairness or a feeling of being unheard or disrespected. Finally, you would address these underlying issues directly by acknowledging and addressing the concerns that have been raised. For example, you might say, I understand that you feel like we're not being fair. Let's talk about what fairness means to each of us and see if we can find a solution that works for both of us. By conducting an accusation audit, you can identify and address any underlying issues that may be causing conflict or disagreement in the negotiation and work towards finding mutually beneficial solutions. Can you give me a list of ideas that would be accusations or negative statements that the selling party might have during negotiation of acquiring their business? Here is a list of potential accusations or negative statements that the selling party might make during the negotiation of acquiring their business. 1. You're not offering a fair price. 2. You're trying to take advantage of me. 3. You don't understand the value of my business. 4. You're not offering enough support during the transition. 5. You're not respecting my employees or customers. 6. You're not addressing my concerns or needs. 7. You're not being transparent or honest with me. 8. You're not considering the long-term potential of the business. These types of accusations or negative statements can arise for a variety of reasons and may be based on the seller's concerns, needs, or motivations. By conducting an accusation audit and addressing these underlying issues directly, you can work towards finding mutually beneficial solutions and building a collaborative relationship with the seller. Chris named his firm the Black Swan Group. What is the concept of the Black Swan in this context and how do we find it? In Never Split the Difference, Chris Voss uses the concept of the black swan to refer to unexpected or unforeseen events or developments that can have a significant impact on negotiations or other business situations. The term black swan comes from the idea that, for many years, people believed that all swans were white because that was the only color of swan that they had ever seen. However, the discovery of black swans in Australia in the 18th century demonstrated that this belief was not necessarily true. In this context, a black swan event is something that is unexpected and outside the realm of normal expectations. In negotiations, black swan events can be difficult to anticipate or prepare for, but they can also present opportunities for creative thinking and problem solving. 
Voss advises negotiators to be on the lookout for black swan events and to be ready to adapt their approach as needed in order to find mutually beneficial solutions. To find black swan events, Voss recommends using calibrated questioning and other techniques to encourage the other party to reveal more information about their needs, motivations, and expectations. By gathering as much information as possible, you can be better prepared to identify and respond to unexpected developments as they arise. Ronald Skelton Should negotiations be done on the phone, Zoom, or in person? And what is the 738-55% rule? The 738-55% rule is a principle of effective communication that suggests that people are influenced more by nonverbal cues than by the words that are spoken. According to this rule, the relative impact of nonverbal cues on communication is as follows. 7% of the message is conveyed through words. 38% of the message is conveyed through tone of voice. 55% of the message is conveyed through body language. This means that when you are communicating with someone, the words you use are only a small part of the message that you are conveying. The tone of voice and body language that you use can also have a significant impact on how your message is perceived and interpreted. By being aware of the 738-55% rule, you can improve your communication skills by paying attention to your nonverbal cues and making sure that they are congruent with your words. This can help you to effectively convey your message and build rapport with others. The 738-55% rule suggests that nonverbal cues, such as body language and tone of voice, play a significant role in communication. Therefore, it is generally best to conduct negotiations in person or via video conference, rather than over the phone, in order to take advantage of these nonverbal cues and facilitate more effective communication. In-person negotiations allow you to see the other party's body language and facial expressions, which can help you to gauge their reactions and understand their perspective. Video conference negotiations offer a similar level of visual communication, although some of the subtle nonverbal cues may be lost. Phone negotiations, on the other hand, rely solely on words and tone of voice and do not provide any visual cues. This can make it more difficult to build rapport and establish a collaborative relationship and may lead to misunderstandings or miscommunications. Ultimately, the decision of whether to conduct negotiations in person, via video conference, or over the phone will depend on the specific circumstances and the preferences of the parties involved. I love the process of negotiations, but we must move on. I guess before I could negotiate, I'd need to know what the business is worth. Explain the valuation process when buying or selling an SMB. The valuation process is the process of determining the value of a small or medium-sized business when buying or selling it. The value of a business is typically based on a combination of its financial performance, assets, liabilities, and market conditions. There are several methods that can be used to value a business, including one earnings multiple method. This method involves calculating the value of a business by multiplying its earnings by a certain multiple, such as a price to earnings ratio. This method is often used for businesses with a track record of stable earnings. Two net asset value method. This method involves calculating the value of a business by adding up the value of its assets and subtracting its liabilities. This method is often used for businesses with a lot of tangible assets. Free market comparable method. This method involves comparing the business to similar businesses that have been recently bought or sold, and using those transactions as a benchmark to value the business. For discounted cash flow method, this method involves projecting the future cash flows that the business is expected to generate, and then discounting those cash flows back to present value to determine the business's value. This method is often used for businesses with high growth potential. Five other methods. There are several other methods that can be used to value a business, such as the dividend discount model, the residual income model, and the net present value method. The valuation process is often complex and requires the input of experienced professionals, such as accountants, financial advisors, and valuation experts. It is important to carefully consider the various methods and factors that can impact the value of a business in order to arrive at a fair and accurate valuation. Explain discounted cash flow valuation and include equations. The discounted cash flow method is a method of valuing an asset or business by estimating the future cash flows it is expected to generate and discounting them back to present value. The idea behind the DCF method is that the value of an asset is equal to the sum of its future cash flows, discounted at an appropriate rate to reflect the time value of money and the level of risk associated with the asset. Here is the basic equation for the DCF method. DCF value equals CFT divided by T. 
where CFT equals cash flow and period T. R equals discount rate. T equals time period. The discount rate is a key factor in the DCF method, as it reflects the required rate of return that investors expect to receive for investing in the asset. The higher the discount rate, the lower the present value of the cash flows. To use the DCF method, you would need to estimate the future cash flows that the asset is expected to generate, and then apply a discount rate to those cash flows to calculate the present value. The resulting value is the DCF value of the asset. The DCF method is often used to value businesses with high growth potential, as it takes into account the future cash flows that the business is expected to generate. However, the accuracy of the DCF method depends on the accuracy of the assumptions used to estimate the future cash flows and the discount rate. Expand on residual income model valuation. The residual income model is a method of valuing a business that is based on the concept of residual income which is the income that is left over after all expenses, including the cost of capital, have been deducted from the business's revenues. The residual income model assumes that the value of a business is equal to the present value of its expected future residual income. To calculate the value of a business using the residual income model, you would need to estimate the following. 1. Expected future residual income. This involves projecting the business's future residual income over a certain period of time, such as 5 or 10 years. This requires estimating the business's future revenues, expenses, and the cost of capital. 2. Required rate of return. This is the rate of return that investors expect to receive for investing in the business. The required rate of return is used to discount the expected future residual income back to present value. 3. Present value of expected future residual income. This is the present value of the business's expected future residual income, calculated using the required rate of return as the discount rate. The residual income model is based on the assumption that the value of a business is equal to the present value of its future profits. This method is often used for businesses with stable and predictable cash flows, such as mature companies with stable earnings. Maybe I got ahead of myself. There is a lot of info I need to value a company that must come from due diligence. Can we talk about what it looks like? Sure. Due diligence is the process of thoroughly evaluating a business before making an acquisition or investment. It is an important step in the process of acquiring a business as it helps to identify any potential risks or issues that may impact the value or performance of the business. There are several types of due diligence that an entrepreneur might conduct when evaluating a business, including 1. Financial due diligence. This involves reviewing the business's financial records, including its income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements to assess its financial health and performance. 2. Operational due diligence. This involves evaluating the business's operations, including its systems, processes, and management practices to identify any areas for improvement or potential risks. 3. Legal due diligence. This involves reviewing the business's legal documents and contracts, as well as any legal issues or disputes that may impact the business. 4. Commercial due diligence. This involves assessing the business's market and competitive environment, including its customers, competitors, and industry trends. Conducting due diligence typically involves reviewing a wide range of documents and information, as well as conducting interviews with the business's management and employees. It is important to be thorough and carefully review all relevant information to ensure that you have a complete understanding of the business and any potential risks or issues. What documents would I review for financial due diligence? Financial due diligence is the process of reviewing and evaluating a company's financial information and records in order to assess its financial health and performance. This is typically done in the context of a potential merger, acquisition, or investment in the company. Here are some of the documents that you might review as part of financial due diligence. 1. Financial statements. This includes the income statement, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows. These documents provide an overview of a company's financial position, performance, and cash flow. 2. Accounting records. This includes the general ledger, accounts receivable and payable, and other supporting documents. These records provide more detailed information about a company's financial transactions and can help to verify the accuracy of the financial statements. 3. Budget and forecast documents. These documents outline a company's financial expectations and plans for the future and can help to identify potential risks 
and opportunities. 4. Contracts and agreements. This includes any contracts or agreements related to the company's operations, such as supplier contracts, leases, and loan agreements. 5. Tax returns. Reviewing a company's tax returns can provide insight into its financial performance and can help to identify any potential tax liabilities. 6. Other relevant financial documents. This may include documents such as insurance policies, pension plans, and employee benefit plans, which can have an impact on a company's financial health and performance. You said step two is operational due diligence. Can you explain operational due diligence? Operational due diligence is the process of reviewing and evaluating a company's operations, processes, and systems in order to assess its efficiency, effectiveness, and risk profile. This is typically done in the context of a potential merger, acquisition, or investment in the company. During operational due diligence, you might review the following areas. 1. Management team. This includes evaluating the skills, experience, and track record of the company's management team, as well as their succession plans. 2. Organizational structure. This involves reviewing the company's organizational chart, job roles, and responsibilities to understand how the company is structured and how work is delegated. 3. Business processes. This includes reviewing the company's key business processes, such as sales, marketing, production, and customer service, to assess their efficiency and effectiveness. 4. Information technology. This involves reviewing the company's its systems, infrastructure, and security measures to assess their capabilities and risks. 5. Suppliers and customers. This includes evaluating the company's relationships with its suppliers and customers, including the quality and diversity of these relationships. 6. Compliance and Risk Management. This involves reviewing the company's compliance with relevant laws, regulations, and industry standards, as well as its risk management policies and procedures. 7. Quality Control and Assurance. This includes reviewing the company's quality control and assurance processes to ensure that its products or services meet the required standards. By conducting operational due diligence, you can gain a better understanding of a company's operations, identify potential risks and issues, and assess its potential for growth and success. I hope this helps to explain what operational due diligence is. Let me know if you have any additional questions or need further clarification. What is legal due diligence and what should be reviewed? Legal due diligence is the process of reviewing a business's legal documents and contracts, as well as any legal issues or disputes that may impact the business as part of the acquisition process. It is an important step in the due diligence process as it helps to identify any potential legal risks or liabilities that may impact the value or performance of the business. During legal due diligence, the following types of documents and information should be reviewed. 1. Corporate documents. This includes articles of incorporation, bylaws, shareholder agreements, and any other documents related to the business's corporate structure and governance. 2. Contracts. Review any contracts that the business has entered into, including leases, employment agreements, supplier agreements, and customer contracts. 3. Intellectual property. Evaluate the business's intellectual property, including trademarks, patents, and copyrights, and ensure that they are properly registered and protected. 4. Litigation and disputes. Review any litigation or disputes that the business is involved in, including any pending or threatened legal action. 5. Regulatory compliance. Ensure that the business is in compliance with all relevant laws and regulations, including those related to employment, health, and safety, and environmental protection. It is important to thoroughly review all relevant legal documents and information to ensure that you have a complete understanding of the business's legal risks and liabilities. You may also want to consider seeking the guidance of legal counsel to help with the legal due diligence process. Can you explain commercial due diligence? Commercial due diligence is the process of assessing a business's market and competitive environment, including its customers, competitors, and industry trends as part of the acquisition process. It is an important step in the due diligence process as it helps to understand the business's position in the market and identify any potential risks or opportunities. During commercial due diligence, the following types of information should be reviewed. 1. Customer base. Evaluate the business's customer base, including its size, demographics, and loyalty. 2. Competitors. Research the business's competitors, including their market share, 
pricing, and differentiating factors. 3. Industry trends. Analyze industry trends, including market size and growth potential, as well as any regulatory or technological changes that may impact the industry. 4. Market demand. Assess the level of demand for the business's products or services, and whether it is likely to grow or decline in the future. 5. Sales and marketing. Review the business's sales and marketing strategies, including its channels and tactics, to understand its approach to customer acquisition and retention. By conducting commercial due diligence, you can gain a better understanding of the business's market position and competitive landscape, and identify any potential risks or opportunities. This can help you make informed decisions about the acquisition and develop a plan for future growth. Okay, we've done our due diligence, have an idea of value. How do we make an offer and what docs do I need to make it official? Are there legal docs we should have had in place by this point? Once you have completed your due diligence and have an idea of the value of the business, the next step is to make an offer. There are several factors to consider when making an offer, including 1. The price. Determine the price you are willing to pay for the business, based on your assessment of its value and your financial resources. 2. Payment terms. Consider how the purchase price will be paid, including any financing arrangements or contingencies. 3. Closing date. Determine when you would like the transaction to close, and any conditions that need to be met before closing. 4. Post-closing considerations. Consider any post-closing considerations such as employment agreements or transition plans. To make an offer, you can prepare a letter of intent or a purchase agreement outlining these terms. The LOI is a non-binding document that outlines the key terms of the proposed transaction, while the purchase agreement is a binding contract that outlines the terms of the sale in more detail. It is important to have legal counsel review any offer documents to ensure that they are legally sound and protect your interests. You may also want to consider having any agreements reviewed by an accountant or financial advisor to ensure that they are financially feasible. Some sellers ask for an NDA. What is that and should I sign one? A non-disclosure agreement is a legal document that protects confidential information from being disclosed to third parties. NDAs are often used when one party is considering acquiring a business and needs to review sensitive information about the business, such as financial records or proprietary processes. Signing an NDA can help to protect the seller's confidential information and establish trust during the acquisition process. However, it is important to carefully review the NDA before signing it to ensure that it is fair and reasonable and does not impose undue restrictions on you. If you are considering signing an NDA, you may want to consider the following factors. 1. Scope. Make sure that the NDA clearly defines the scope of the confidential information that is being protected and what is excluded. 2. Duration. Consider the length of time that the NDA will remain in effect and whether it is appropriate given the nature of the information being shared. 3. Exclusions. Look for any exclusions or exceptions to the NDA, such as information that is already publicly known or that you are required to disclose by law. 4. Restrictions. Be mindful of any restrictions on your use of the confidential information, such as limitations on sharing it with others or using it for a specific purpose. By carefully reviewing the NDA and negotiating any necessary changes, you can ensure that it is fair and protects your interests while also allowing you to review the necessary information to make an informed decision about the acquisition. Now we are ready to close. What are the steps to closing and what documents are likely needed? The closing process is the final step in the process of acquiring a business. It involves completing any outstanding tasks, signing the necessary documents, and transferring ownership of the business. Here are the steps typically involved in closing an acquisition. 1. Review and sign the purchase agreement. Review the final version of the purchase agreement, including any negotiated changes, and sign it to make the sale official. 2. Transfer ownership. Transfer ownership of the business to the buyer, including any assets, intellectual property, and contracts. 3. Pay the purchase price. Pay the purchase price, either in a lump sum or according to the payment terms outlined in the purchase agreement. 4. Obtain any necessary approvals. Obtain any necessary approvals from regulatory bodies or other third parties, such as government agencies or lenders. 5. Complete any outstanding tasks. Complete any outstanding tasks, such as transferring leases or obtaining insurance coverage, to ensure that the business is ready for the transition. 6. Hand over the keys. Hand over any physical keys or other assets to the buyer and provide access to any digital assets or accounts. To complete the closing process, you will need to sign and exchange a variety of documents, including the purchase agreement, 
Any financing documents and any transfer documents related to the assets or intellectual property being transferred. It is important to have legal counsel review these documents to ensure that they are legally sound and protect your interests. We closed. We own it. You said the next step is integration. Explain integration. Integration is the process of integrating the acquired business into your existing operations. It typically involves the following steps. 1. Assessing the business. Evaluate the business's strengths and weaknesses and assess how it fits into your overall strategy and goals. 2. Developing a plan. Develop a plan for integrating the business, including any necessary changes to systems, processes, or personnel. 3. Communicating with employees. Communicate with the employees of the acquired business to ensure that they understand the changes and what is expected of them. 4. Implementing changes. Implement the changes outlined in the integration plan, including any necessary training or support for employees. 5. Tracking progress. Track the progress of the integration and make any necessary adjustments to the plan. Integration can be a complex and time-consuming process, and it is important to approach it carefully and systematically. By developing a clear plan and communicating effectively with employees, you can ensure a smooth transition and maximize the value of the acquisition. What if this is our first and only business? Explain this but only include steps that are unique because it's our first and only business. Sure. If this is your first business, there are a few steps involved in integrating the acquired business that may be unique to your situation. Here are some steps you might take in integrating your first business acquisition. 1. Setting up systems and processes. Set up systems and processes to support the operation of the business, such as accounting, payroll, and HR. This may involve selecting and implementing software or hiring additional staff. 2. Building a team. If you do not already have a team in place, you will need to build one to support the operation of the business. This may involve hiring employees or contractors, or retaining key employees from the acquired business. 3. Establishing a brand and marketing strategy. If you are acquiring a business with an established brand and customer base, you will need to consider how to integrate the brand and marketing efforts into your overall strategy. If the business does not have an established brand, you will need to develop one and create a marketing plan to attract customers. 4. Developing a plan for growth. As a first-time business owner, you will likely have a long-term vision for the business. Consider how the acquisition fits into your overall plan for growth and develop a roadmap for achieving your goals. By following these steps and seeking the guidance of advisors or mentors, you can ensure a smooth integration process and set the foundation for future growth. What do you mean by evaluation is the last step of an acquisition? Evaluation is the process of reviewing the results of an acquisition to determine its success and identify any areas for improvement. It is an important step in the acquisition process as it helps you understand the impact of the acquisition on your business and identify any areas for improvement. To evaluate the success of an acquisition, you should consider the following factors. 1. Financial performance. Review the financial performance of the acquired business, including its revenue, profit margins, and cash flow. Compare these metrics to your expectations and to the performance of the business before the acquisition. 2. Strategic fit. Assess how the acquired business fits into your overall strategy and goals. Consider whether the acquisition has helped you to achieve your desired outcomes such as expanding your product line or entering a new market. 3. Integration. Evaluate the success of the integration process, including any changes to systems, processes, or personnel. Identify any challenges or issues that arose during the integration process and consider how they could be addressed in future acquisitions. 4. Customer and employee satisfaction. Review feedback from customers and employees to understand the impact of the acquisition on their experiences. Consider whether customer satisfaction and retention have improved, and whether employees are supportive of the acquisition. By evaluating the success of an acquisition, you can identify areas for improvement and make adjustments to your acquisition strategy as needed. This can help you maximize the value of future acquisitions and achieve your business goals. It sounds like there is a lot of specialized knowledge that goes into SMB acquisitions. Who would I put on a team of advisors to help with this process? When acquiring a small or medium-sized business, it can be helpful to have a team of advisors to support you through the process. Depending on your specific needs, you might consider engaging the following types of advisors. 1. Legal counsel. Legal counsel can help you to understand the legal implications of the acquisition, review and negotiate any documents, and ensure that your interests are protected. 
2. Accountant or Financial Advisor An accountant or financial advisor can help you to understand the financial position of the business, assess its value, and review any financial documents or projections. 3. Industry Experts Industry experts, such as consultants or former industry executives, can provide valuable insights into the business, its market, and its competitive landscape. 4. Business Coach or Mentor A business coach or mentor can provide guidance and support as you navigate the acquisition process and integrate the business into your operations. 5. Broker or Investment Banker If you are using a broker or investment banker to source deals or facilitate the transaction, they can provide valuable expertise and support throughout the process. By assembling a team of advisors with diverse skills and expertise, you can gain a well-rounded perspective on the acquisition and make informed decisions. What questions would these potential team members to make sure you selected the right professionals? When interviewing potential advisors for your acquisition team, you may want to ask the following questions to help ensure that you select the right professionals for your needs. 1. What experience do you have in the relevant industry or area of expertise? 2. What specific services can you provide to support the acquisition process? 3. How have you supported clients through similar acquisition processes in the past? 4. What is your approach to working with clients? 5. What are your fees and billing practices? 6. Can you provide references or testimonials from past clients? By asking these types of questions, you can gain a better understanding of the advisor's experience and capabilities, as well as their communication style and fees. This can help you to select advisors who are well-suited to your specific needs and goals. How long does the search and acquisition process take? The search and acquisition process can vary significantly in terms of how long it takes. Factors that can influence the timeline include the size and complexity of the business, the availability of financing, and the negotiation of terms. In general, however, you can expect the process to take several months, if not longer. Here are some key milestones that you may encounter during the acquisition process. 1. Search The search process can take anywhere from a few weeks to several months, depending on how aggressively you are looking for deals and how quickly you are able to identify potential acquisition targets. 2. Initial contact and rapport building Once you have identified a potential acquisition target, you will need to make initial contact and build rapport with the business owner. This process can take anywhere from a few days to several weeks, depending on the availability of the business owner and the level of interest on both sides. 3. Negotiation The negotiation process can take anywhere from a few days to several weeks, depending on the complexity of the deal and the willingness of both parties to compromise. 4. Due diligence The due diligence process can take anywhere from a few weeks to several months, depending on the size and complexity of the business, as well as the level of cooperation from the seller. 5. Closing The closing process can take anywhere from a few days to several weeks, depending on the complexity of the deal and the availability of the necessary documents and approvals. Overall, it is difficult to pinpoint an exact timeline for the acquisition process, as it can vary significantly depending on the specific circumstances of the deal. However, by carefully planning and managing the process, you can help to minimize any delays and ensure a smooth and successful acquisition. What books about buying and selling businesses would you recommend? There are many books available on the topic of buying and selling businesses, and the best choice for you will depend on your specific interests and needs. Here are a few recommendations. 1. The E-Myth Revisited, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It by Michael E. Gerber. This book provides a framework for understanding the key challenges and opportunities that small business owners face and offers practical advice for overcoming common pitfalls and achieving success. 2. Exitpreneur, The Playbook for Selling Your Small Business by Joe Valley. This book provides a step-by-step -step guide to the process of selling a small business, including tips on preparing for sale, valuating the business, and negotiating with potential buyers. 3. The Art of M&A, a, a Merger, Acquisition, and Buyout Guide by Stanley Foster Reed. This book is a comprehensive resource for anyone looking to buy or sell a business, covering everything from valuation and financing to legal and regulatory considerations. 4. The Private Equity Playbook Management's Guide to Working with Private Equity by Adam S. Coffey This book provides a practical guide for management teams looking to work with private equity firms, including tips on preparing for and navigating the due diligence process. 5. Value-Based Fees How to Charge and Get What You're Worth by Alan Weiss This book this book is a resource for professionals who want to improve their pricing and value proposition 
with a particular focus on the small business and consulting sectors. I've interviewed both Joe Valley and Adam S. Coffee, awesome people, but I'd really like to buy a business before reading five books. Can you summarize these five books for me? Sure. Here is a detailed summary of each of these five books. 1. The E-Myth Revisited, Why Most Small Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It by Michael E. Gerber. This book is a classic guide to small business management and argues that many small businesses fail because their owners are too focused on the technical aspects of their work and not enough on the business itself. Gerber identifies the three primary roles that small business owners must play, technician, manager, and entrepreneur, and discusses the importance of balancing these roles in order to achieve success. He also provides practical advice on topics such as marketing, finance, and leadership, and offers a framework for developing a scalable and sustainable business model. 2. Exitpreneur, The Playbook for Selling Your Small Business by Joe Valley. This book is a comprehensive guide to the process of selling a small business, covering everything from preparing for sale to closing the deal. Valley discusses key considerations such as valuating the business, identifying potential buyers, and negotiating the terms of the sale. He also covers key legal and financial considerations and offers strategies for maximizing the value of the business and minimizing risk. 3. The Art of M&A, A Merger, Acquisition, and Buyout Guide by Stanley Foster Reed. This book is a thorough resource for anyone looking to buy or sell a business and covers a wide range of topics related to mergers, acquisitions, and buyouts. Reed discusses key considerations such as valuation, financing, and legal and regulatory issues and offers practical advice on how to navigate these challenges effectively. He also discusses the cultural and organizational challenges of mergers and acquisitions and offers strategies for managing these challenges successfully. 4. The Private Equity Playbook, Management's Guide to Working with Private Equity by Adam S. Coffey. This book is a practical guide for management teams looking to work with private equity firms and provides insights into the private equity process and the key considerations and challenges that management teams face. Coffey discusses topics such as preparing for due diligence, negotiating the terms of the deal, and integrating the business with the private equity firm's portfolio. He also offers strategies for building a successful partnership with private equity and discusses common pitfalls to avoid. 5. Value-Based Fees, How to Charge and Get What You're Worth by Alan Weiss. This book is a resource for professionals who want to improve their pricing and value proposition and offers practical strategies for setting fees, communicating value, and negotiating with clients. Weiss discusses the principles of value-based pricing and offers practical examples and case studies to illustrate how these principles. Wow, we've covered a lot today. Thank you for teaching me about buying a SMB. You're welcome. I'm glad that I could help. If you have any other questions or need further guidance on the process of acquiring a small or medium-sized business, please don't hesitate to ask. Good luck with your acquisition journey. Thank you, and that's the show. This show was entirely done by AI. My voice, our guests are both fake. I did formulate the questions and edit the script, but the answers are 100% chat GPT and unedited. Did this be the death of all mentors and gurus? I have to admit, in this limited exercise, there wasn't one question that the artificial intelligence couldn't answer. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and M&A decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now